Wait, 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 wait. You don't even know where I am yet, do you? Yes, that's right. I'm in India, and I can't wait to tell you why. Stick around, and i got a tale for you. Bars, well, bars going with me. The stone is here, obviously. Um, yeah, passport. I got my papers. I still use the pronoun. We check. Three thirty-two. Here we go. I am India bound. Beautiful two. Tory traveled loaded and hauling a shot. Okay, so I left Kansas four long flights and thirteen and a half thousand miles ago. It's been about 52 hours since I last got out of bed and I'm half an earth away from home, standing in front of the airport in Rajamundri, India, waiting on my ride. Since I've got some time to kill, it's probably a good time to tell you who I am and what this whole kebab is all about. My name's Steve, and I live and work at an animal sanctuary and education center in Lewisburg, Kansas, where some really dedicated volunteers work hard to give a lifelong home to some amazing beings like lions, tigers, leopards, wolves, and more. We do our best to educate the public as to how fast their natural habitats are being destroyed and how few of these animals remain in the wild while stressing the importance of the roles they play to preserve what remains of the ecosystems they call home and that we all depend on. Just as importantly, we put our brains, hearts, and hands where our mouths are and actively support the boots on the ground, the dedicated groups and individuals in the fields making the greatest difference and having the biggest impact. I'm here about to head out to the literal edge of remote India because of one of these individuals. I'm here because of this cool cat. Well, yeah, technically. That's a fishing cat. More on that in a minute. Really? This whole story starts with this one. This is Ashwin. Ashwin is one of the most energetic and passionate people that I've ever had the pleasure of meeting, and he loves fishing cats. So, about these cats. Fishing cats are an incredible species that live in the wetland habitats and mangrove forests of India and Southeast Asia. About twice as big as a house cat, they have webbed feet and have a call that sounds more like a barking dog than a cat. They hunt at night along the banks of the rivers and waterways, actually fishing. They patrol the shallows and even dive out into the deeper waters after their prey. But there's a big problem. Fishing cats are disappearing as fast as their homes are being cut down. With less than 500 cats estimated living in the wild, that number is shrinking as the forests they call home are being decimated. He's got a lovely bunch of coconuts. Do you want to drink some? Yeah. In the regions where we're heading, to the coastal wetlands and the edge of the mangrove forests, many of the farmers in the rural communities have fallen down a rabbit hole into aquaculture, a crude and expensive method of farming fish in earthen paddocks. It takes a lot of expensive machinery to build the berms and a lot of diesel fuel to keep pumping the fresh and salt water in and out to keep the fish healthy, but it's unsustainable. It just doesn't work, and when the pond is too polluted for the fish to survive, it's abandoned as the farmers either go bankrupt or move on to fresh land to start the process all over. With the increasing global demand for cheap fish, the forests and the cats don't stand a chance. But Ashwin is out to change that. He's organizing motivated groups taking action in the forests themselves, and he can always use more help. That's why I'm here. Through our mission at Cedar Cove, we understand that helping to fund these efforts is only part of the solution, that so often it's the people power in the heart of the matter that can make the biggest difference. Right now, I'm in a car with Ashwin, Pranav, one of the team members, and our driver, and we're headed out after lunch from the city of Rajamundri, where I landed, for a three-hour drive to Amlapuram, the town where the Fishing Cat Conservancy base office is. 
There, we'll re-equip, transfer vehicles, and begin the last two-hour leg of our journey to our final destination, Beach Camp. At this point, I should be exhausted, but I am wide awake and wired by all the sensory input that's been flooding in since I first stepped foot off the plane. I'm mesmerized by the constant waves of colors, sounds, patterns, and activity all around me. And people. Literally everywhere I turn, there are people. People walking, driving, sitting, standing, talking, selling, buying, building, eating, relieving themselves, cleaning, doing nothing, and what else I have no idea. The density of humanity in every nook and cranny is staggering, and the warmth and curiosity of the people themselves is humbling. But I'm struck most by the glaring fractures I'm seeing, the debris and refuse of a multitude of cultures that live at a junction between a modernized economy of disposable portions and a horticultural Garden of Eden with harvesting, gathering farmers living on a vibrant land that has been bent from one purpose to another to support a population that has tripled in the last 70 years and is crying out under the load. And that population is the challenge. More people need more food, more food takes more farming. But farms don't live in isolation from the world. They require the diversity of nature, and nature requires even more diversity to survive. So there are obvious, definable limits, and it's obvious we're coming up on them fast. These are all young palms? I mean, are these all, like, cultivated? With every kilometer we travel, I can see the magnitude of the problem growing and taking on a life of its own. Uh, yeah. Wherever you turn, you can't escape the effects of humanity. And I can see clear battle lines where nature is losing the fight. I'm starting to get that sinking feeling like I just walked into a class only to discover there's five minutes left on a test. At this point, my eyes and brain are literally pulsing from the sensory input and I'm awed into silence as I continue to absorb my surroundings. One more stop before we get to the base office where we'll load up our gear and some equipment and head out on the last leg of the trip. One more hour and a half to the edges of the map and of civilization as we know it. After having a look around the field house, we have some time to relax while waiting on some other team members to arrive before we set off, and I make the most of it. This is the first time I haven't been moving in 54 hours and I'm stiff from being folded up, but I'm also eager to get to our goal after coming so far and being so close. Almost immediately as we leave Amapuram, the character of the landscape changes from palms, coconuts, and fields of rice to open regions with a very distinctive pattern of dirt levees holding brackish ponds, with diesel pumps pushing muddy water back and forth until it's someone else's problem. I've come face to face with the aquaculture I've heard so much about. Ask Nara clean just Nara. Uh, zoom out. Zoom out fully. Zoom out fully. It's going to spread. As if to underline how closely tied the communities are to the local ecosystem, we shortly run across this gentleman out fishing the freshwater canals for his evening meal. Freshwater canals that have become the dumping ground for all the waste-filled water pumped from the holding ponds. So usually this aquaculture pipe is running and it spews out all the crappy medicinal water. Yeah. And so these guys are the ones who suffer in the end. Uh oh, you got one. <laughs> Every one of these ponds was manufactured by digging, scraping, bulldozing, and mounding earth into walls around areas that were likely once rice fields and were spoiled as neighboring aquaculture ponds leached salt water into them. Ironically, at that point, the only thing the land is good for is the aquaculture. But as I mentioned, it's unsustainable. The ponds can yield fish for four or five years at best, all the while the farmers are buying expensive diesel fuel to run old pumps and paddle wheels in an attempt to get oxygen to the fish, oxygen that they would naturally get in an otherwise open ecosystem. But with the health and quality of the fish declining over that period, the farmers begin operating at a loss, and unfortunately the majority end up severely in debt from the startup and operating costs. This is when the land is left to spoil. This is all I see now as we get closer and closer to the Godavari Delta, a vast wetland that was once home to thousands of acres of protective mangroves. Before long, we're two kilometers away from the beach camp. We've stopped at a village where Venkat, village leader and one of the camp caretakers, is waiting for us. We arrive just in time for lunch and I'm treated to my first authentic Indian meal in incredible surroundings. Despite the serenity, we have to push on. 
Two clicks, one lagoon, and a beach away is our final destination. Hey, we should rename it to Fishing Cat Lake. Huh? <laughs> fishing Cat Lagoon, not lake. This is not a lake. Yeah, Fishing Cat Lagoon. Sir. Beach Cat Lagoon. The lagoon. Salt water and a lake for lake. Have you seen the movie Interstellar? Yes. So, up ahead when the la lagoon's full, it looks like Miller's Planet. <laughs> oh, yeah. And you're coming across the first mangroves on the left hand side. Aquaculture on the right, mangroves on the left. As you can see, the roads are getting more and more treacherous. Six feet off a sheer drop to my left is a lagoon that was once a freshwater body and a main source of fishing for the locals. These are stunted growth mangroves. Right, Pranav? Why is it stunted growth? Because of high salinity. Years ago, a storm surge inundated it with salt water from the ocean, completely destroying one ecosystem and leaving others to eke out an existence in its place. A storm surge of the old mangrove forest would have once been able to absorb, thus protecting the lake. Bay of Bengal. Bay of Bengal. One last turn along the ocean and we're almost there. After venturing halfway around the world on a quest within a quest, I'm about to finally arrive at my home for the next nine days, beach camp. You have the county, right? First impression. You are seeing it as I am seeing it. Beach. Sounds of the 